Hi everyone, it's Debbie and I'm recording a podcast <laughs> in my glass house and it's, I think 105 degrees outside. So in here it's like that hot. So I've got this fan that I'll turn off because it's so loud, but check this out. If you're watching the video, it's one of my dad's collections of fans because they always like to be cool. And uh, you put it around your neck and it has different lights and keeps me cool because it's hot in here. So I'm wearing my bathing suit because I was swimming today and then a beach cover up. So I'm ready to go swimming, <laughs> but I'm more dressed for this hot weather in my little podcast studio here. So I am going to record a fun pot. Oh, there we go. Hot. I level podcast with Dr. Cazelli. And if you're a runner, you probably have heard of Dr. Mark. He is a low carb runner for over 10 years, wrote the book called run for your life. And he was just here in San Diego last week, speaking at the low carb USA conference, which I missed and wanted to connect with him because I want to share how to fuel and train for the endurance athlete, but also how to get faster running. I'm on a mission to get my run speed back. I once upon a time would do marathons. 312 was my best Boston time, 317. And my half marathon, I best was Carlsbad up here where we live now. And I 133, 135, somewhere in there I try to hit. Now I'm lucky to get a, a two hours, my goal for a half. And to me, that is like 25 minutes off my goal time. So I've got a ways to go. I'm challenging you that is not about blaming the aging process, but embracing the aging process and women. And I think men too, as we get older, instead of doing all the long, slow distance, we need more recovery time, like two days in between our running and more speed work, but not overtraining. So it's a fine line when I'm working with clients, where to place those key workouts and get rid of the junk miles and not try to run every day, but have a purpose to each run, have your long distance run in appropriate timing before a race. I'd add in pace work. And then during the week, I'm doing the minimalist effect, you know, 30, 45 minutes on a run up to an hour, but less is more. I used to do a lot of volume and now I'm just doing less workouts, more of the minimal effective dose and doing a long run on my Sundays as I've done forever as an Ironman athlete. Yeah. Bike long Saturdays. We run long Sundays is just my routine and <clears throat> excuse me, the challenge is just figure out you know, work hard, run harder, but recover in between those intervals and do, as I said, more active recovery in between those days. Finally, I joined the San Diego track club last week and did a Tuesday night run group at 6 PM. I'm an AM person to work out hard. And so evening is a challenge, but I did it. And the other challenge is it, it disrupts my sleep. So I'm sacrificing my eight o'clock bedtime because I wake up early so I can get track workout in. Because if you can find a group near where you live, you, I used to always do Tuesday nights, 5 30. And then I used to run out my own run group at Wednesdays at 6 PM. It really helps challenge you and pushes you for those intervals. So if you're doing 400, 800, thousand meters, 200 meters, we did a little bit of everything should be equal to three miles of speed work, but really going hard and the recover, which is one thing, the recovery, I walk, get my heart rate down and then jog and then start the next one. But I was fascinated by these people that I was running with doing speed workout. They would jog on the recovery. I'm like, how can you jog? I need to walk. So I think people can go harder if they recover longer. So kind of that rest-based training, I like so anyways, let's talk to Dr. Mark. We'll talk about nutrition and training. And he had some exercise tips to give people and then um, exercise testing. So let's see what he has to say and bring him on the show. Hold on. All right. I've got the man, Dr. Mark, on the show to talk all things running, efficiency, fueling, training, how to improve our speed, performance in races, longevity, all of the above. You're going to tell us the secrets. Thanks for coming on and, and joining the low carb athlete podcast. Thank you, Debbie, for having me on. I don't know if we'll be able to hit all that in an hour. I know, but, right. But I, we'll, we've so many we'll topics. Yeah. We'll see so what direction it goes. I think just this, I'll 
I shared your intro in the intro, your background, just if people haven't heard of you, I've heard of you, as I said, for years and, you know, going into metabolic efficiency testing into natural running four years ago. And I used to own a fitness studio for 10 years and I attempted to host all these events like the natural running seminars with, um, who is it? Oh, the new, who did it for Newton running shoes. He Danny did Abshire, yeah. probably Ian Adamson. Yeah. Ian, yeah, Ian. Way back. Yeah. Yep. So we Ian used to do I that. Travel 10 years a lot ago. teaching this stuff. Yeah, that's right. That's probably where I met you for your name from, but you know, all this information over the years, what is your, how long you've been doing this? What is the biggest thing you think is what we need to share with people in today's date of, you know, people learning about more so low carb and fueling, getting faster and metabolic efficiency. Where, where do you think we are in the running industry and endurance athletes? Yes, it's a, it's a great question. And maybe like to bring it down to like one slide. <laughs> I think, I think what all of us are trying to do, Debbie, is try to become like a, a healthy human organism, right? Yes. And that has to do with hardware. So that's strength, posture, structure, you know, bone density, muscle mass, like that's how we're built. And then there's software that's how we move right that's uh, all the biomechanics that mm -hmm. ian and newton running <laughs> and i used to try to teach you know don't smash into the ground with your leg over stretch but that has to do with your movement patterns all day you know like how you lift things how you sit how you stand because uh, people end up with musculoskeletal injuries all, all the time and some of them are debilitating injuries you know mm -hmm. disc herniations needing knee and hip replacement so how we move is important but then our energy systems are really important. So that's how we make ATP. You know, that's the currency of, of muscle contraction. So if any one of those are greatly neglected, you know, the whole yeah. system shuts down. And um, I think you know, we're all just trying to get, get better and stay in the game, whether you're trying to compete or not. You know, we're, we're all just trying to be able to get ourselves up off the floor, you know, 80 or 90 years old, so we don't end up in a care home. But but then we all want to be able to, if, if we don't have those elements in place, you know, you you and I both love to be outside doing anything, right? Hiking, running, biking, being with friends. And if, if you can't have those components. Now go. <laughs> and we got interrupted quickly there, but yes, if any one of those components aren't there, you know, we're, we're not going to be happy. People will have depression too, you know, like, I, my mood stabilizes every morning if I can go run and mm -hmm. I don't think the rest of my day would work. So I think everyone has to just look at it like what's in it for them and, and why do they want to stay healthy? You know, it's not about, you know, I'm almost 56, you know, it's not about setting personal records, you know, or finishing ultra long endurance events at the end of the day. It's, you know, those are just kind of, you know, icing on the cake if you could do those things. But I think if, if any of us out there listening, if we took away your ability to go exercise, I think your life would not be be whole. And there, you could probably take away your entire retirement account before you would want me to take away your physical activity. And I think that'd be a fair statement. Like what would make your life less fulfilled? <laughs> losing your entire retirement account or losing your ability to go out and do what you love. Yeah, and I think that's so important as we get older that we, focus, as I say, every show to focus on how we're training to set ourselves up for 70, 80, 90 years old and be able to move right and have good posture and have physical ability to keep doing what we're doing and thrive every day. But what are some things that we can do now to improve our endurance? So metabolic efficiency we've talked about on and off over the years. Maybe start with that and how to improve fat oxidization. If people are fat adapted athletes, how do we get faster and train so we're burning fat at a higher rates because we talked to Zach Bitter we talked to S Fuels Leighton Phillips and you know really diving into this a little bit more to teach people all right I'm fat adapted now what like how do I improve that aerobic engine and get faster and be able to go longer yeah that's a great question not with one direct answer because if you compare what's happening in Zach Bitter's physiology to some, I, I deal with diabetes patients all day to a type two diabetes patient. So we call it a zone two and, and what zone two is, and everyone listening here probably is familiar with that term, you know, that's that aerobic base. And what that really represents is the maximum effort or, you know, maximum heart rate where you're recruiting the type one fibers. So, so the type one fibers are the fibers that are highly efficient at using fat for fuel. Now, someone like Zach Bitter can probably run at a seven minute mile 
still be in zone two, meaning he's not needing to tap into what are called the in-between fibers, these fog fibers, fast, fast oxidative and glycolytic fibers. So he's pretty much staying just in type one. And by doing a lot of work in that area, you're building tons of capillaries and mitochondria in, uh, in those type one fibers. And the magic that that does is that allows us to actually do more work later in the higher zones. Because in the higher zones, what happens when you go into the exercise lab is your lactate starts to trickle up. So we all have a level of exercise where we're maintaining the same lactate levels. We're able to clear this out without uh, developing acidity. And we're trying to push that up. Now, if you have a huge uh, base of type one fibers, this is like old Arthur Lydier training, like whether you were a miler or a marathoner, he had everyone go out and do these 20 mile runs, just uh, most of that off season training. Um, but if they started even in season to, to get kind of stale or overtrained, he would have them go back and do that zone two stuff. He didn't call it zone two, but that aerobic stuff. So you're building this huge, huge base of type one uh, mitochondria capillaries. And what happens is now, like say you're in a race, like say Zach is running a hundred mile race and he's got to just haul up a mountain where he's tapping into zone three, maybe even a little bit into zone four. He's creating more lactate, but his massive uh, base of type one fibers can shuttle that lactate back in to these magical energy chambers called mitochondria. So instead of shuttling to acid, these the lactate can shuttle back into the mitochondria and produce more ATP and no acidity. So I hope that makes basic sense, but the bigger that type one base, the more you can use fat for fuel and the more you can even go into that sugar burning zone, but still be able to maintain the pace. Um, now a, a diabetes patient, for example, and, and you've talked about respiratory exchange ratio and yeah. crossover points on your show. So if a well person is just walking the dog, they're, that's zone one. You know, you're just going out for a little walk, walking the dog. Um, you're using almost all fat for fuel and your respiratory exchange ratio is about 0.7. It means you're not producing a lot of carbon dioxide. Now, if uh, while, while on that dog walk, um, someone starts chasing you and you start running <laughs> and now all of a sudden your respiratory rate picks up, <laughs> So now your respiratory exchange ratio is about one, you're burning carbohydrates and you're blowing off more CO2. So therefore your respiratory rate picks up. So I think anyone out there, you know, riding a bike or running, you know, say you're on a easy coffee ride with some friends and then all of a sudden, you know, your younger friend starts tightening the screws, right? They could still be in zone two chatting away and, and you're, respiratory exchange ratio goes up. But a diabetes patient, we're talking about type two diabetes, not type one, yeah. totally different physiology. So these folks are at 1.0 at rest. Mm. And when they go for a walk, even out the door, their lactate goes up and they're hundred percent carb burning, you know, just, and they, they're miserable. They don't like it. I've done thousands of exercise tests in the hospital on mostly medical patients, not athletes. And they get acidotic in uh, what we would call a Bruce protocol at stage one, yeah. stage two. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and your, their heart rate goes up, their respiratory rate goes immediately up as soon as they start walking. So that person really needs to fix their diet first and go ridiculously slow. <laughs> so, and I'm talking about ridiculously slow. Is that like Maphetone, the max aerobic function or what slow? Probably even mm -hmm. lower um, because for, they can't even burn fat for fuel sitting on the couch, you know, so they've got to, you know, ideally be low carbohydrate. There's some medications that can help those folks become more insulin sensitive. So they're the sick folks. Mm -hmm. Now the folks like Zach, you know, they're really well enough. He wanted to upregulate his ability to use fat for fuel more than the normal Tour de France rider, which he has done. Um, people, we could link to the faster study. Yeah. So people who have fat adapted, you know, meaning taken months, months, and months, even years to upregulate their ability to burn fat for fuel. This is where the low carb diet comes in. And those folks can burn up to like 1.8 grams of, of fat per minute where um, the normal mortal elite athlete who's not fat adapted might be about 0.6 to 0.8. So, so that's a choice an athlete makes based on whatever type of event. So, so Zach's type of events are perfect for that. They're hundred mile races. There's no, what we would call glycolytic work. 
were a Tour de France racer, there is a ton of times in that Tour de France where they've got to like go all in mm -hmm. and be able to kind of light matches, so to speak, to be able to burn fast acting glucose to be able to go up Alpe d'Huez. Mm -hmm. So they're Ironman, you know, really not much glycolytic work. So if someone's training for an Ironman, it would behoove them to be massively fat adapted in diet and training both because there's really not much sprinting or, you know, surges or, you know, you, you watch the Tour de France attacks, right? But maybe back in the Mark Allen days, you could watch them and, and they were really kind of attacking each other on the bike and there was some of that stuff going on, but well, for yeah. most- if you're pro in yeah, Ironman, it's totally different than age group. Or, or, like I would try to, yeah. to be best in my age group, but I would, you know, be pushing it hard on the bike to keep my top end of my aerobic heart rate. And, and my goal was always how fast can I get to stay, you know, at my peak heart rate where I'm still burning primarily fat. So then you can go into the run and, you know, feel pretty kind of fresh. And then you can do what you can to finish and <laughs> pick it up and do yeah. surges. But yeah, I think it depends, you know, if you are just trying to finish it or are you trying to place in your age group or your professional trying to win money? <laughs> yeah. And again, yeah, the professional winning money is a different ball game too, because it, it takes, you know, and I've been in the exercise lab multiple times and it probably took like four years of being low carb before I was up in that upper, you know, 1.8 grams per minute. Mm -hmm. of fat oxidation so if you have a pro contract on the line or you know you got to feed the family and it takes two years to fully adapt to to fat metabolism but you're going to sacrifice some performance <laughs> you, you may not be willing to make or if you, yeah that that type of a sacrifice so again but most of us are in this for health so i think making yeah. that adaptation is there's no downside for your health and ultimately your performance but um I think something we could talk a little bit about, Debbie, was so during that event, so, and we talked about it in San Diego this weekend, what a lot of people don't realize or understand, they're called these um, insulin independent glucose transporters, blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> I'll bring that down into, so you take uh, you or me sitting around and uh, say, I put some honey in this tea right now, which raises my blood glucose. And then insulin will respond and bring this little transporter called GLUT4 to the surface of the cell and bring that glucose in. Now, if I start exercising, muscle contraction will also bring these little magical GLUT4 receptors to the surface of the cell, meaning now that I'm exercising, I can dispose of glucose. You know, and if you've trained that system well, you can dispose glucose while you're exercising. So you kind of keep that blood glucose stable. Mm -hmm. So if you listen to, to Zach and his race strategy, when he's racing, you know, he's not relying on glucose, but certainly he's adding, you know, esters and some other carbohydrate containing products, you know, so you're able to kind of drip that carbohydrate in without needing insulin to rise. So you're not shutting off your fat burning engine. So that thing is still going strong. Mm -hmm. you know, because you started the race, you're burning fat, and now you're able to trickle in the glucose without raising insulin. Insulin shuts off fat burning. So the worst thing someone can do, and someone asked this question this weekend, you know, what do they do before a long event? A guy was going to be swimming some long channel. It was going to be like a five hour swim and wanted to make sure, you know, he's maximizing fat oxidation and say, what you don't want to do is have a bunch of carbs before you start your event because that spikes your insulin mm -hmm. and then you, you know, start the swim or start your race insulin's up. So you're not burning fat at all, but once you get moving and you get that, you know, I call it like the electric battery and then the gas tank. So the electric battery is like, like fat burning, you know, you get that big log on the fire going and then, you know, you can trickle in glucose and low blood glucose. You know, if any of y'all have experienced that during an event, um, will make you want to just stop because your brain says, Debbie, I'm done, right? And then it, right, you, everyone has experienced this. They think they're done, right? They think they've just bonked. And even on like a ultra course, you'll take a shot of Coke or something mm -hmm. like that. And it brings you back from the dead. Yeah. <laughs> because what that did was your blood glucose was just tanking. 
and it wasn't that you bonked, you were out of glycogen, you ran out of, like, we never run out of fuel. Our brain protects us from dying. So if it's sensing blood glucose is down, it's shutting off motor units and it's just telling you stop. But that's mm -hmm. something to play with. Always have a little bit of glucose. And even if you're fully fat adapted, you know, always have a little bit of glucose. Once you're moving, you know, that glucose is like rocket fuel. Yeah. You know, like on top of your, your big fat burning battery, so to speak. So that kind of goes, ties into what we're saying is been talking about a lot is, is training low, like Dan Plews, I've been going over his into your program and it's that train low and Peter Dafty optimal fat metabolism, fat metabolism we talked about mm -hmm. a lot. So training low and then matching that with your exercise, with your fueling, keeping your carbs low and eating more healthy fats and protein, and then strategically timing your carbohydrates. So you're in a fat adapted state, but what I'm finding a lot of people and, and different theories and Jay Feldman's talking about energy metabolism, it's still like, we need to be able to metabolize carbs. So there's a few different thoughts. Oh, we'll yeah, kind of break it up, yeah. but that's like, you know, how to teach people to burn fat, how we're training and how we're eating. And then once you get to a certain point, I feel like people still need to be able to metabolize carbs because a lot of people go one end to the other and they don't realize they have to flex back and forth. And I think that's becoming a, a big topic lately is, all right, I'm fat adapted, I'm keto, now carbs, I'm scared of carbs because they'll spike my glucose and I don't want to get out of fat burning when I'm training or racing. Yeah, actually the opposite is true. <laughs> you know, like everything, or, you know, there's two sides to every argument and then there's yeah. the truth, or at least we keep searching for the truth in, in science, but human experience tells us a lot. So the, the, the really amazing work has been done by a gentleman named George Brooks. Uh, he's, he, 30 years, he's been talking about lactate and the lactate shuttle and Inigo San Milan at University of Colorado has written a lot on the topic. So, so the best zone two athletes, you know, Tour de France riders, any, any endurance uh, triathletes, marathon runners. So the best zone two athletes, you know, can burn the most fat at very high power outputs. There's even, a, there was an article with Elliot Kipchoge's physiology and his fat max, even though he's not a low carber and he's probably only burning about 0.8, I'd have to pull up the, pull up the study, but his fat max, like that's his zone two, where, where you're maximally using fat for fuel before you start shifting to more glucose. He's running about a five minute mile. Yeah. And then the article was about what it would take to do the 159. So when he's doing a 159, he's like light matches. He's like 12% fat, 88% sugar, you know, at 438 pace. And at five minute pace, he's like 80% fat, 20% sugar. So it's like dramatic. Like, so how do you push that out? Mm -hmm. You know, so that he had strategic carbohydrates during that event, you know, they do the, do the wind tunnel testing of all the pacers, you know, it's all the magic they did to try to really um, cut that, you know, cut that, that little margin out. But what you also see in the best fat adapted athletes, they're also the best sugar burners too, mm -hmm. because of that big zone too, and their ability to absorb lactate. So the diabetic patient, for example, can't even burn carbs well, their mitochondria are so dysfunctional, even though they can't burn fat at all, they can't even burn carbs well. But the best zone two athlete, you know, someone back in your day, Debbie, like Mark Allen, right? So, so he did a ton of zone two mafetone style training but he could burn carbohydrates and fat like a beast, right? So then on race day, I'm sure he's using carbohydrates very efficiently because he can still like use both tanks. So, so by that doing yeah. that zone two training, you're boosting your ability to, to be flex, metabolically flexible would be the, you know, the term people throw out, but to optimize metabolically flexible, you wanna have, right? Just like you have a vehicle, you wanna have a big electric battery and a, and a good gas engine too. And then you're like, good to go. Not like a little, little one. You don't want to have a big electric battery, little gas, you know, then, yeah. you know, you might not be able to floor it up the mountain. So that so, maybe that's a good way to think about it. Would you train people first staying in just zone 200% of the time? And then like Maffetone would do that until you're not seeing results, do a monthly test and then start adding in speed work twice a week. For example, like Paul Larson talks about hit science then work on nutrition or you how would you suggest oh, i think i think mix it all in and make do what's fun for you so i think people become slaves to technology 
it makes it less fun. And I think a lot of us, you know, probably you too, Debbie, at this point, like, you know, if you can carry a conversation, you're, you're in zone two-ish. Yeah. So you're fine. Now, if on a weekend you want to join the group and, and add some diversity and go a little quicker, that's totally fine. Um, every day you should be doing something for neuromuscular speed and coordination, you know, doing something for strength. So I finish every day, you know, I'm just doing like morning meditative zone two-ish running just to clear my head. But at the end of that run, I'll take like 10 minutes to do sprints and skips and strides and different things, plyometrics to work on that neuromuscular coordination and strength where after 50, you know, we all know that that starts to decline. So the older you are, the more you got to add that stuff in. So I think it's good to do end of your too. workout. But oh yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah, for sure. And that's an actually a really important point, Debbie, because people, oh, should I start my workout with more intense stuff and then and then uh, finish it with the more mellow stuff. No, because what that'll do is it'll sabotage the slow stuff because once you've developed high lactate, you've shut off fat metabolism. So if you do a bunch of intervals like early in your workout and then say, well, then I want to go th finish with 30 minutes of zone two, your lactate is up. So, so you're not using fat at all. Now, all of us kind of know intuitively if we're going to do high intensity, it always feels good once you've kind of got that zone two engine opened up. And then you feel like you're ready to do something a little bit harder. If your brain feels like it, right? Like if you've had a hard day at work, poor sleep, a lot of stress, don't add another stress, but just think of it like that. You know, so, so you, once you've kind of built up a lot of lactate, you've shut off fat. Mm -hmm metabolism so so start mellow and then add that stuff at the end so tie in nutrition ideally. with nutrition with that so if you are doing a workout we we're saying before you don't want to eat carbs beforehand because you'll shift carb metabolism when you want to be doing a longer like zone two workout so if you are finishing on hit would you in the morning do you do it fasted or oh, of course yeah morning? i mean i think you know i think i mean none of us are probably out listening to this or we're not doing four hour professional workouts. So ours would be, you got an hour and you could do 50 minutes, yeah. you know, zone two easy and then 10 minutes of hit. But no, if you're going to be doing like, say you're a Tour de France rider on a professional team and you've got a four hour ride and which with an hour of that being high intense, of course, they're going to add in some carbohydrates, you know, to be able to do that mm -hmm. intense part of that workout because they're, they're, they're shooting for power and performance. So they won't be able to reach those performance goals without, but that's probably 1% of people listening to this yeah, or in that, in that. that <laughs> So when you work out, you work out in the morning, do you have coffee with anything in it or what do you do before a long workout or a short workout? Just coffee. Yeah. I mean, just coffee. And even on a weekend, if I'll go out for two or three hours on some trails, just coffee, you know, no creamer in it. No, sometimes I'll put, I have a little of this product called Health Code, which Ben Bigman oh, yeah. made. I don't know, he's he's the guy, if you want to talk about insulin, get him Yeah, on I know, show. I've had him a couple but, years uh, yeah, ago. Yeah, so I like his product. I'll just put like half a scoop of the chocolate stuff. It's got little protein. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's he's brilliant. I, I like it and use a little whisker. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, just a little bit of coffee. Yeah, I've been and doing then, Laird's yeah. Superfoods. They have a Laird's creamer that's coconut, has some MCT oil and, oh, yeah, and some adaptogens. That would so be perfect. Just I'm getting the unsweetened because it doesn't have the coconut sugar in it, but because mm -hmm. I can't do, everybody has stevia and monk fruit mm -hmm. and erythritol, and I can't do any of that. So I'm just going back to the unsweetened or, and just add, you know, some collagen and if, or creamer stuff in it. But that's always a big question is to eat or not to eat. When to do have something beforehand, especially a female athlete is always like, what did you eat the night before? When did you stop eating? You know, are you fasting too long? And when is it another stressor or when you're already stressing your body and your workout? So kind of, it gets so confusing. It's yeah. like, well, what's yeah. intensity of your workout, your duration? What did you eat the night before? And what else, you know, hormones yeah. for food? And I think it's so individual too. So like if what works for me, if it doesn't work for you, don't do it. So yeah. So if you want to add people on longer runs, want to add a little bit of like low glycemic stuff, you just don't want to spike your insulin, you know, have yeah. a bagel before you go out the door. But, yeah. you know, if you have something with some fat protein, a little, you know, tablespoon of nut butter, you know, or bring a, a little, uh, you can gel on a ride with you, which is kind of slow release carb. If you're going to be out there a couple hours, sure. Electrolytes are key too. You know, this is like what I, it's because I've been drinking this up like crazy. This is just the non-caloric oh, hydrate. 
Yeah. yeah, so it's good. I'm I'm recovering from COVID now, so I'm going through <laughs> gallons of, of you know, yeah, been sweating heavily the last uh, seventy two hours. Yeah, so just me, drinking me too, but not that's yeah. because it's hot here. <laughs> yeah, it's hundred degrees in LA. Yeah, so I think it's important to talk about you know what to eat, the when, and the why for athletes, but if there is a point to add in carbohydrates and that it's neutral, natural carbohydrates, because as I said earlier, people are afraid of any carbohydrates. And then when they are able to give you, you know, that backup engine for rocket fuel. So if you are doing a higher intensity workout or doing like a, I did 6 PM track workout Tuesday night that, you know, should I have something beforehand? Cause a lot of times I think we all get or type A, triple A, ambitious, high charging athletes that we think more is better. Like, okay, I could do this totally fasted and not eat. And like a, a long bike ride, I could not eat, but is it affect, when does it impact my performance? I'm actually going slower. And when having a little something, real food sources can improve my performance when I'm trying to get faster and stronger. Yeah, I think that Debbie comes down to blood glucose. You know, so if, if you have a 6 p.m. track workout and you had lunch at 11 a.m. and your experience last time you tanked at like the second interval, oh, your, your blood glucose probably tanked. And, you know, I've got one of these now in, in my arm, you know, so a glucose monitor, you know, will at least give you data, you know, on what's going on yeah. with yeah. you. Yeah, CGM. So I have an exercise today, but, you know, it's pretty flat you know, had some eggs this morning, but probably again, you're going to be using those insulin independent um, pathways while you're exercising. So I think something that has a drink, maybe that would have just a little bit of carbohydrate and probably a little bit of caffeine at that, like it, it, it's an after workout thing, play with that because, and, and even between, like if you're doing a track session between intervals and you'll be like, oh my gosh, that just like, brought me back from the dead I mean yeah and you know like in all these ultras like these old school ultras I mean there's little shots of coca-cola like at every aid station not big amounts just like a little bit that can bring that blood glucose back up so that does not affect your fat oxidation but it'll make that exercise session not drudgery you know none of us want to just suck through something and suffer no but just play play with that not big amounts of carbohydrate even like 10 grams of carbohydrate you know well, 10 grams raises your blood glucose you yeah know, i think that's like point. what amount is okay because we're afraid i think most of us because we've done this so long or there's new people that they're afraid of spiking their glucose and a lot of people are insulin resistant i have type 2 yes. diabetics and they're afraid of adding any carbohydrates in and sticking to more of a keto carnivore but their performance, I think, is suffering. And so it's like, all right, you know, what, what even are carbs that are good quality sources of real food that's not going to cause my insulin to go up too high, but will help me perform better? Yeah, I think your important differentiator there too is, as we spoke before, Debbie, is who is insulin resistant type 2 diabetic and who's insulin sensitive well. You know, the person who's on the type 2 diabetes spectrum, their body can't handle carbohydrates. So that's the group I'd say use a lot of caution because their glucose is going to go up high and their insulin is going to keep cranking up to try to store that glucose because they're resistant. Whereas someone who's fully insulin sensitive, you know, you put glucose into them and their insulin needs to go up just a little bit and knock on the door and it puts it right in your muscle and liver. The insulin resistant person, they use the same amount of glucose and their insulin has to bang on the door. So getting a medical evaluation. You know, so if you're pre-diabetic, diabetic, central obesity, high triglycerides, we call it the metabolic syndrome, increased blood pressure. We need to get you healthy first. And then you start to worry about the nuances of how much carb you're going to add for your exercise. Because what we really worry about is heart disease in those people. Because if you have metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, you know, we know data in the women's health study, it's a 21 years, 28,000 women. So if you have that syndrome, you're a six to seven times risk of cardiovascular disease. Yeah. And it's like, oh, maybe you shouldn't be doing intervals now. Yeah. You know, get a calcium score. So that's coronary okay. calcium score. Like who, who is the person who might want to mellow it out because of their cardiovascular risk, you know, and make sure they're building those mitochondria where that person who's uber well, you know, they're just trying to play with performance. You know, and some people thrive low carb for performance and some don't. Mm -hmm. So if we have well people, not all um, 
well, athletes need to be low carb, um, all get fat adapted by training in zone two, high or low carb. That's what I think the missing piece is. People think, oh, these carb eating Tour de France riders, they're massively fat adapted compared to the general population. Now compared to someone like Zach or you know one of the true low carb elite athletes, no, those guys can burn more fat than the carb eating endurance athletes. But all the endurance athletes are like just are massively fat adapted just by the fact their mitochondria work so well. They can burn fat. Elliot Kipchoge running a five minute mile, burning fat like a beast, and he's eating a lot of ugali. <laughs> but his his machine, he can burn fat like you know, like, like the best of them at probably the highest rate of speed and efficiency. Hmm. So can you just summarize? I think there's a lot of people that are insulin resistant and type two diabetics and endurance athletes, because they're reaching hmm. out a lot. So what are like some steps, things that we can just kind of review, summarize and like step one, what should they do to get started on being a low carb athlete? They're trying to do marathons, Ironmans, but they're you know, I see people's blood chemistry labs and their cholesterol, their insulin, you know, well, no one's ever, it's hard to get people to doctors test insulin, <laughs> but, you know, A1C looking at their, all their inflammatory markers, how can people get started if they already are working on nutrition, just keep doing that and what to do with their exercise, how to time that. Maybe. Yeah. So if you're listening, you know, you could do kind of a little checklist um, and I have a little book I give to patients I can share with you. We, it's, it's our little patient guide on how to start. So if you have three of these five situations, you have insulin resistance. And this goes back to like the early 80s, a, a gentleman named, named Gerald Raven, he published about a thousand articles on the topic. So one would be central oh, central weight. So are, are you carrying weight around the middle? And, and you know, most people just know that by looking in a mirror, Phil Maffetone will describe it as two times your waist should be less than your height. So just, are you carrying, are you an apple shape? So if that's a check, yes. Do you have high blood pressure or on blood pressure medication? So that would be like top number 130, bottom number 80. So if you're higher than that, you've got that one check. Do you have triglycerides over 150? And high triglycerides means your insulin is packaging carbohydrate high insulin levels packaging carbohydrate, really trafficking that to your adipose tissue. So triglyceride over 150, HDL if you're a woman under 50 or a man under 40. And what happens is the HDLs, as those triglycerides go out, the HDLs will kind of try to repackage those. So the HDL, it's always a seesaw effect as triglycerides go up, the HDLs tend to go down. And the other is abnormal glucose, fasting glucose greater than 100 or if you have a, the diagnosis of prediabetes by what's called a hemoglobin A1C, and you can get one of those kits at uh, any CVS or pharmacy. Yeah. So if you have three out of five, um, you gotta reduce your carbohydrates. You're by definition or insulin resistant carbohydrate intolerant. If you have all five, you know, you really gotta do it. And, mm -hmm. and as a doctor, you know, the people that are really sick, you know, the people who are fully, fully type two diabetic, you know, you could call it prescription strength, low carbohydrates. So these folks need to get ideally to about 20 grams of carbs a day yeah. to unpack that liver. It's probably not most people listening to the show. These are people that are super sick because um, they, they need to like totally reset, you know, control, alt, delete, like their body, they're burning uh, zero fat even during their sleep. Now, people that are fat adapted, high level athletes, they can stay in keep, keep nutritional ketosis eating 100 grams of carbs a day because they're just churning through the carbs while they're exercising. So that group can have a be more liberal with their carbohydrates and still be in a similar metabolic state. So find a good clinician to be able to look at, you know, where you are in this in the spectrum. The more you're in that insulin resistant state, the more you got to slow down because you really have to retrain your body to use fat for fuel at rest and during activity. And as like like we were mentioning before, they start walking out the door and their respiratory exchange ratio is one. Mm -hmm. So they're not burning. It's still good for their muscles, but it's not gonna be fun because they get acidic and they're just, no one really likes that. So we wanna get those folks to slow down. The pool is amazing for those folks because they tend to carry a lot of weight, joint issues, and their heart rate gets up super high mm -hmm. doing anything weight bearing, but getting in a pool, oh, yeah. It's like magical. And I'm sure you've trained people in a pool, Debbie, and like people yeah. that have trouble getting like up off a chair, 
they get in the pool and they're like gloriously happy and they can move and yeah. they can swim and like get them in a pool. Um, you're in LA, you've got lots of pools. Yeah, of or San Diego, I go to Solana Beach, so which I have my swimsuit because I was going to master swim today and then I got busy. <laughs> so it's just a way to keep cool. But I think it is, is like the fit, I know Dr. Eric Westman says 20 grams of carbs a day and then other people say 50 grams, but for athletes that are working out, but oh, yeah, they, they are showing that. signs mm -hmm. of insulin resistance, they can go a little higher, like 100, even more I've heard. But would you say as an endurance athlete, do you find, is it important to stay in nutritional ketosis all the time or to flex in and out of it if you are prone to insulin resistance, type two diabetes? No, I don't, I don't think, I just think you want to be efficient at burning fat for fuel. Yeah. Um, people that have been like, I've played with all these meters. Once you've been low carb for years, even decades, your body becomes very efficient at utilizing ketone body. So whether you've got a breath meter or a, you know, a, a blood test sample, you know, the levels tend to get lower doing the same thing, the longer you are in it. And I don't, unless you're using a, a ketone level for something therapeutic, so, so patients who have seizure disorders, mm -hmm. neurologic disorders, uh, specific levels of, of ketone, which cross the blood brain barrier, help those conditions. But if you're just looking at exercise, how you feel, sometimes just go intuitively by how you feel. Mm -hmm. So um, don't be, be tied to the meters. And um, no, you don't need to be in, in ketosis. You want to burn optimal. fat to be burning mm -hmm. fat in your long workouts and spare glycogen, to, unless you're doing a surge or speed work or, you know, grand finale to the race to the finish line. But I think it is like, is it you're burning fat? Should we want to see 0.1 ketones, 0.5? Yeah, you can be little? burning fat and, and drawing a zero on your ketone yeah. meter. That's what it's, I'm trying to tell people. Yeah. You don't need to, you don't have gosh, to no, no, you can be yeah. 0, 0.0 on your ketone meter. And if you just went out on a four hour bike ride, you know, maybe took a hundred calories the whole time and you came back feeling good, you were burning fat on that bike ride. I mean, there's no other way around it, you know? So, so um, yeah, don't, don't be as, you know, I think those are good measures to get people um, just aware and starting. Most people who are kind of failing in this, they, the carbs kind of creep in, at least on the medical side. Um, but I don't really use a lot of ketone meters with, with patients that they get, I'm dealing with patients in rural West Virginia, you know, just getting them to check their blood sugar is, is usually enough. I'm adding another layer of complexity, but, you know, Verda Health, for example, which is getting amazing results, you know, with the, like you, Debbie, they have coaching. So all of their patients get high level coaching, you know, three times a day. So they're using ketone meters because if someone's kind of, you know, fallen off a little bit, okay, this is just an, a, a marker that can help the coach remotely okay where's this patient was mm -hmm. was doing really well and now they're gaining weight again and sugars are going up and their ketones went back to yeah. zero and then you'd say if it were you debbie debbie just what's going on in your life the last couple of days you know yeah. not judgmentally and you'd be like oh shoot it's, no it's fine right? you yeah. know the bread came back you know you went out to the bar and started drinking craft beer no it's all okay just get back on board I know that's what's hard for people. It's usually doing family activities or going out with friends or going out to restaurants or a party. And they just, I, I was trying to tell people, this isn't a diet. You're just yeah, it's eating real food. It's, it's a lifestyle. And it's just, this is what makes me feel good. And someone said once earlier this year, I think it was low carb conference cruise that we did with Dr. Ken Berry and uh, that you're protecting yourself. You know, you're choose not to eat those whatever processed foods or that wheat vegetable oils because you're protecting yourself and not feel guilty that you have to eat everything you're served at someone's house or you know you had a party and that's all there is to eat you know how you can make the best of it but I think it is when people get off the rails that I think they're thinking it's dieting they're still in that diet mentality rather than this is how I choose to eat to make myself feel good and not have to feel crappy for days afterwards. Yeah, people ultimately, Debbie, they just kind of change their identity. And I think that takes a while for it to happen. And you've coached people, like yeah. you've taken people who would never identify themselves as athletes, right? Somehow they find you. Mm -hmm. And then a year later, and they don't have to be winning races, and but they found a new tribe. And it's like, oh, I'm an athlete. And this is how I behave. And their identity just changes. And they can go into a church picnic at that time. And there's mac and cheese and all this stuff. But they're, they're fine. And that that, that takes a while, I think, 
for, and once people are in that space, then they're good. I mean, they could have a cheat meal, but they don't have a cheat day. And patients have told me that so many times. They've learned that lesson again and again. Yeah. You know, like, like you can have a you know a bad meal, but you can't have a bad day because then it all yeah. goes off the rails. Right. And we call it self sabotage. Yeah. You know, they self sabotage. Maybe it's like missing two straight workouts. Right. Never miss two straight workouts because then you're I like, know. oh, I've blown it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, it's, it's all good. So anyone listening here, if they've never self-sabotaged or had a bad day or a bad meal or, you know, then you're probably not real. So, so it's it all happens. fine. Yeah. Just work on changing your identity. You know, and I love Ken, you know, I've, I've met him several times and spoken with him at conferences. You know, he just shares the love of this and he, he has such a, a way to make this so simple, plain and clear. I know. And just His common YouTube sense. videos. Dr. Yeah. Ken Berry, if anyone wants to learn more, he just has these videos as yeah, many his, viewers. His in your face YouTube videos. Yeah. He's, he's another, you know, Southerner, like, you know, um, um, Appalachia. Where Nashville. I'm, yeah. Yeah. So we're going to be out of time, of course, but the best place to find you and watch videos, because we didn't, it's another show to talk about running form and drills and things, how we can get faster, talk stuff I haven't talked about for 10 years, probably of what we did with Ian eons ago, <laughs> nice. how we can get faster running i know you had some youtube videos you've got you're like you've got two river two rivers track. yeah we have a we have a retail a store here yeah. so yeah so probably the best place you can go and it'll link to all these places is drmarksdesk.com because then you can get to the shoe store um, we have a, a website called natural running center mm -hmm. um, which has a lot of videos of all the running form and then i wrote a book it's called run for your life and we have a website for that book called runforyourlifebook.com. And then there's a research page, which has all kinds of videos on drills and running drills, strength training stuff. You know, so if you want to dig deeper into that stuff, those resources are there and they're all free. I will check that out because I've been into those. Do you ever watch Knees Over Toes guy? Yeah, that's a really good I'm exercise to, yep, yeah, that's like really powerful stuff, like for just I, I'll do that every day in some uh, kind of platform, just almost down to ground level, being able to, you know, smash my hamstring against my calf. But that's a great uh, assessment to show where people are just yeah. locked, whether it's I, I've got, or I know it's blockers. crazy because I know my left side has been this area of opportunity for a couple of years. And I found like trying those things, I have to hold on to something to do it right to get yeah, this get left symmetric. side to fire but people can running backwards out. too i like those guys like talk about running backwards we yeah, i did that yesterday on the beach forward nice. backwards tory pine Good. great mile run you can do so yeah, I'll beautiful have, beaches i know that's my benefit of living here just 12 miles into the beach tory pine solana beach it's perfect so We'll put everything in the show notes. And then if you want to come back on, talk the rest of it. And I'll add a little extra to the finish. If people want to know more about um, some drills on your video, I can talk about too. So thank you so much, Dr. Mark. Well, pleasure to be Good on, time. Debbie. Stay cool there in yeah. LA. I hear it's like a, like a decade uh, heat wave this week. I know. It's, it's supposed to be 105 on Sunday. Jeez. <laughs> 90s crazy. at the beach. So it's a little toasty. Wow. So. wow. Thank you. I'm glad we were able to work this out.